What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. Uh, this is episode number 131, and my head is literally spinning. We have just heard in the last hour or so that Rishi Sunak has been named the new Prime Minister of the UK, and that is something like five Prime Ministers in the last four years or something of that nature. It's uh, certainly not a moment too soon because the UK has some, well, the whole world, but the UK is dealing with some really serious um, problems and some uh, serious economic issues. And um, this podcast today, I'm going to be going over some of those. Um, and so we really need to get, uh, I mean, the, the government really needs to get a handle on this. There's some serious problems for the property industry. And um, this new prime minister, hopefully he can get you know started and get kind of a clear run at it because the shit show that was Liz Truss's premiership really did quite a lot of damage and people with property right now are really worried about the cost of mortgages and loan repayments and all that kind of stuff. This Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, by the way, happens to be the youngest, at the age of 42, he's the youngest Prime Minister in the UK in over 200 years. And on top of that, he is the first Hindu Prime Minister in uh, history of the UK. Now, before I get into it, just a little bit of context about today's podcast. This is a replay of the live stream Q&A that I hosted last Wednesday. And so as soon as you hear this uh, podcast, you're going to realize that it is already out of date because at the time of recording, Liz Truss was still the prime minister. And no sooner had I finished the live stream and I was basically uploading it uh, to my uh, editing software and sure enough, uh, Liz Truss had just resigned. So it was out of date straight away. I had intended to put it out as a a kind of a, a bonus episode, but in the end, I decided, you know what I'll do? I'll use it today and I'll just put it out there for any of you listening in who have not yet heard the live stream. Uh, this should give you an idea of what of the kind of stuff that we cover. And I think it uh, it might be something that you would like to participate in directly because you can ask questions, you can get answers directly from myself. Now that is every Wednesday at one o'clock and the podcast uh, or sorry, the live stream goes on for about 45 minutes. And um, if that is at one o'clock Irish time or UK time, if you're listening in from the US and you wanted to participate, that does not, uh, that goes out at 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Now, the other thing I just wanted to mention is, before I kind of kick off the, the, the live stream recording, is this is the last week, pretty much, well, next week, a couple of days of next week, but this is pretty much the last week you have a chance of joining my upcoming Mastermind cohort. The Mastermind is, at the intake has been open for a couple of weeks now. I've mentioned it a few times, if you haven't heard already. But this, um, it's going to be, it's a six-month program. It's coaching stroke mastermind with myself. And um, at the end of the six months, we, we do meetups uh, every now and then. At the end of the six months, you remain an alumni of the program. And so you're invited to every single meetup that we do. It's an in-person invitation only uh, meetup. So anyway, if you're interested in signing up or learning more, just reach out to me. I'm going to put details below in the comment section or in the show notes of the podcast. And so reach out and, and we'll have a chat and just see whether you're uh, eligible to join that program. So guys, without further ado, this is my live stream from last Wednesday. I hope you found it useful. You are listening to Behind the Facade, and I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher. On this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously, both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you are a regular listener, I have a little treat for you. This is a bonus episode taken from my weekly live stream Q&A, and you'll find this going out live over on my main YouTube channel, and that is at Gavin J. Gallagher on Real Estate. 
quick reminder, I do this every Wednesday live. So if you're listening in from Ireland or the UK, that is at 1 p.m. You might call this a lunch and learn. Uh, but if you're listening in from the US, it's 8 a.m. Eastern. And so you might call it a breakfast briefing. I call it the Property Investor Roundtable. So this is real estate news. Now, I always like to start the uh, real estate news with a look at the kind of the global market. And the global market starts always with the Financial Times property sector because they have a great roundup of the major stories that are taking place around the world in, in the real estate sector. And uh, so it doesn't really matter whereabouts you are located. If you are listening in um, from the US or from Ireland or from the UK, you're going to find some pretty good headlines in this particular um, paper. And so, uh, yeah, so the property sector, like the first thing that they're saying is UK property debt maturities point to a looming financing gap. Now, there's a major fears of a financial, uh, a commercial property fire sale, certainly in the UK and potentially spreading out around the world. And that is because we've been in this really low interest rate environment for quite a while now. And there is, without a doubt, uh, higher interest rates coming back. And so it's, it's, it's a little bit like when the reverse takes place, we call it yield compression. And so what happened back in the early 2000s, when the Eurozone, when the Irish market went into the Eurozone, became part of the Euro, we were all used to these much higher interest rates. And then suddenly we were benefiting from the level, the level of interest rates that Germany had. And when that took place, we suddenly saw this huge drop. Like we were used to borrowing money at you know sort of seven eight nine percent and then suddenly it was dropped right down to kind of like four or five percent now that's called yield compression when that takes place because what happens is the properties that we you know if you're buying property at say a million and you're borrowing your money at nine percent then the income from that property has to pay off your mortgage at nine percent and so you're only able to pay a certain amount so prices of property and assets were set because of that interest rate now when all of a sudden it fell to half of that all of the prices suddenly shot up because now all of a sudden instead of paying you know for nine at nine percent mortgage rate you're now sort of saying i can actually borrow the same amount um, and have half of the amount of interest to pay so property assets shot up in value, but a lot of people mentally aren't ready to pay that increased prices. So the people who were really smart moved quickly, shot in and bought property, and they seemed like they were overpaying to the people who were kind of around them. But as the year or two passed, they suddenly realized they got it at exactly the right price and the market shot up to kind of meet them. That was an absolute bonanza at the time. And so that was the yield compression of the early 2000s. Now we're in the complete reversal of that. And it's it's what, what's the opposite of compression? You're basically looking at tension. You're looking at yield tension now where you're going to start seeing everyone who bought properties at you know 2% yield and 4% yield and stuff, those yields are, are going to widen now. And you're going to suddenly see people are not prepared to pay 4%. They might pay 5 or 6%. And all of a sudden, property prices are going to fall in order to meet that. So that is what the guys are pointing to here. The first headline about debt maturities and the financing gap. You're also looking at um, Bellway PLC. Now, this is another house builder. Last week, I was talking about a house builder called Barrett Homes. And they were saying that they were expecting house prices to slow down significantly. Here's Bellway, which is another house builder in the UK, and they're saying that UK property sa sales have slowed. So that's two sets of publicly traded housing companies that are now um, selling uh, or saying that they're going to be paying, you know, selling at lower prices or that there's less sales expecting, expected. Real estate investors circle as property funds offload offices and warehouses. There is a gap between buyers and sellers on what constitutes fair value. This is going exactly to what I just mentioned. And it is that the big funds that are now facing pressure in the UK in particular, because what you had was the, um, the, the, the complete cock up that the Chancellor of the Exchequer made with the mini budget. And suddenly they've had to reverse everything and not just reverse, they've had to like basically throw out everything 
And so it's a, they're, they're the laughing stock, first of all. But second of all, what it's done is, is, is it pushed up borrowing prices. And so all of these funds that were doing these, they had, they expected everything to be running at a very, very normal kind of a rate. All of a sudden, those rates have kind of shot up and everyone is playing, is on the back foot playing catch up. So what that's meant is people are now offloading properties and or they're going to be offloading warehouses, offices. And there's a lot of guys waiting in the wings. We'll say contrarian investors who are basically expecting the prices to fall significantly and they'll be there to pick up. Now, a few days ago, there was a, another warning. And this is actually from the U.S. market. They're talking about the U.S. housing markets, big chill. And that is because the, the inflation issue in the U.S. is really, really severe. And it's come out again, more information that is even more uh, pointing towards the severity of it. So instead of them being able to say, OK, no more interest rate rises, we are now looking at a situation where there's going to be significant more incre increases in interest rates. And so naturally, everybody who has a mortgage in America uh, or who wanted to get a mortgage is just not going to be able to afford to pay the previous amount that they were prepared to pay. I know people that were buying property and they were locking away their mortgage for like 30 years at 2%. The very same mortgage today, the lowest price they can get is like 6.5% or something. So you're looking at really, really steep decline in property prices and housing prices and the, and the ability to, to buy property. So that's really starting to hurt the US market. Um, we also have, and this was a really interesting one that I'm just gonna focus on, Goldman Sachs sounds alarm on UK commercial property. And the bank predicts prices could fall 15 to 20% by the end of 2024. This is pretty much in line with what I've just been saying. And what I really believe is, is that we're in that complete reversal of the yield compression. And you're going to start seeing now, I see the very same article, Bloomberg covered it, and I have it here on the screen. By the way, if you're looking in on TikTok or on Facebook, I'm actually doing this. There's actually thunder outside at the window at the moment. It's all happening here. Um, I'm actually doing this live stream over in my YouTube channel. That's Gavin J. Gallagher on real estate. And this is a live stream. So if you want to look at the slides that I'm actually talking about and the headlines and stuff, they're on the screen here over on that channel. So anyway, I'm going to be doing a Q&A after this. So any questions you guys have, throw them in there and I'll be happy to answer them. And same with the Facebook group and same with the YouTube. So getting back to the headline, Goldman Sachs predicts 20% drop for UK commercial property. Now, this is in line with what we're saying. It's because of the increase in UK bond yields. Chancellor, um, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, his mini budget basically screwed everything up and it's created this real problem. So what we have now is the bank is expecting property prices to fall by as much as one fifth. And they're saying that traded, uh, publicly traded landlords like property companies that have their shares listed on the stock exchange and stuff they're expecting their funding to increase by as much as 75 percent uh their their borrowing costs and so you can see how all of this is going to push a lot of um, property players into negative territory and so there's um there's a lot they're saying there that they, this could knock 700 million uh off the value of companies and stuff like that. So it's a it's a pretty serious situation. And we're going to be looking at hi Christina, it's good to see you there. The um anyway, we're going to get on to the next headline. Now, this is from the Sunday Business Post, which is an Irish weekend newspaper that we get here. And it was interesting to see they came out with this headline that typical income for Irish house buyers has risen to over 71,000. Now that is um, based on the central st statistics office. That's after the, uh, the census that was done a couple of months back. And it shows that purchasers are also getting older, which is gonna lead to um, some social issues. Um, but it just shows how in the last couple of years, purchasers income, the, mean in the median income from property purchases has risen from 48,000 as being the annual earnings in 2012 to 10 years later, it is now 71,000. So that's a significant, we've basically looking at nearly a doubling of our income in that period of time. Now, of course, property prices have also probably jumped in that same period of time. 
Something that I found quite interesting because I'm in the commercial sector is that Dublin office market take up in quant- in this third quarter of this year was uh, exceeded pre pandemic levels. And um, that's interesting because it's certainly I have seen an awful lot of um, shifting the way things are happening at the moment, the property sector, the commercial sector in particular. God, the thunder is, is pretty loud out there. Um, we have got a situation here where tenants in buildings like commercial property, office tenants, they're, they, they've come back to the office, but they're not coming fully back to the office. And so what you're having is people are coming in two or three days a week as opposed to the full week. And so a lot of property occupiers are now sort of saying, should we downsize the amount of office? Do we actually need the amount of desks that we did before? Because a lot of people can choose to stay at home and work from home. And I was speaking to somebody in one of the big tech companies recently, and they were saying that their productivity was actually up during the uh, during the pandemic which is interesting given the fact that people were all working from home. There was this perception amongst management that if you let people work from home, they're all going to be dossing off and they're not going to be doing any work. It turns out that it was the opposite. And also absenteeism dropped. So people might decide, you know, they're hungover, they're not, they're going to call in sick today and they're not going to drive to work. But if they are at home and they're hungover, they can spend an extra hour or two in bed, get up and actually get to work because they feel better. And so you're in a situation where absenteeism is up or is down, productivity is up. And so a lot of people are now reassessing how they're looking at the commercial property sector. And sure enough, this goes against my my understanding of the way the market is running. The fact that then the levels of increase now seems a little unusual to me, but it's good news. And I'll, and I'll certainly take it as, as good, uh, good to hear. We have an article here. I, I subscribe to a, a, a magazine called The Currency, or it's like a news thing. And they're talking about the bill to rent uh, construction sector, and it's likely to be scrapped. And this is something that I covered on my podcast earlier in the week. And what I was talking about was the fact that the housing crisis are going to get an awful lot worse because with interest rates increasing, the big developers are facing a squeeze on all sides now because what they had before is they would agree with the the bill to rent was basically that you would build an apartment building. The apartment building would be pre-sold to a big pension fund. So a pension fund, let's say from Germany or something. Now they've been getting a lot of names they've been getting this uh, nickname the cuckoo funds because people don't like it and that's because irish people certainly let's talk about the irish market here the irish people who like first time buyers are getting priced out of the market by these big funds and that was the perception so they were kind of saying it's not fair i want to go and buy an apartment and i was going to go and buy one in this block and the block is for sale uh own is, is not for sale anymore it's just been sold to this big fund the entire block lock stock and barrel and So obviously there's a lot of disappointment in that. Now, what's happening is the developer came along, they priced up the construction and they found somebody who's prepared to buy the entire block in one go. And they said, well, that's a pretty risk-free deal. I actually know the outcome right from the very beginning. So before I even start on site, I know that I'm going to get X million for this block of apartments. All I need to do is manage my costs and deliver the project to these people and I'm going to make my profit. What happens, though, is that the pandemic hit and obviously we've got supply chain issues now and we have got labor shortages. And what's happened is with everything coming back, suddenly construction prices are going through the roof. We've got inflation across the board. We've got labor issues across the board. We've got um, the supply chain issues across the board. And so what we now have is about 20 percent increase in construction costs over the last couple of years. Everyone has seen it. It's actually shocked the market and so you've got people that they have this fixed price that they're building the building for the building is going to be handed over to this big fund we'll say and instead of building the pro- the building at x million they're now x million plus the 20 percent extra so they're losing that amount of profitability that they were expecting now to make matters worse they now also have got the um the funding costs are being affected as well. Whereas before the interest rates were like almost zero, now they are increasing with these interest rate increases. And so now instead of, you've got construction prices going up, funding prices uh, costs going uh, going up as well. And it's creating this kind of squeeze in the middle. 
And to make matters then doubly worse, the big funds that are looking at buying these properties and that are doing these pre-sale deals, the pre, pre-construction deals to buy it, they're now pulling out of the market. And they're pulling out of the market because interest rates have shot up and they can actually buy German bonds and they can offload German bonds in a, in a split second. Like all they have to do is pick up the phone or push a button and hundreds of millions of bonds can be sold. Whereas if you buy hundreds of millions of Irish property, it's going to take you, you know, a year or two to offload that portfolio. And so they're sort of saying, now nah, our risks, we would much rather have everything sitting in German bonds than sitting in Irish property. And so they're now pulling out of the market. So you've got it hitting the, the big developers from all sides. And so that's what's happening here. The fact that, you know, this article goes into all of that anyway, it's quite, it's worth reading, but I'm not going to kind of get stuck on it. The big news today, and this is something that kind of was a bit of a shocker for me opening the paper today, was that mortgage lending rules are set to be eased. So this has been the big problem in the Irish market for the last couple of years, is that you had uh, the mortgage, the central bank had this cap and the most that you could borrow, if you were going to go and get a mortgage, you went in and you're you're earning 50,000, whatever your salary is, you could borrow 3.5 times that salary. And that was kind of a limit that they weren't prepared to bend. Now, there was the odd, like, little bit uh, of wiggle room with some banks based on the numbers and stuff. But three and a half times was the level. That is being shifted now to 4%. So this is some way for the, the central bank and for the government to kind of say, let's at least get people back into the market. So what that's going to do is it's going to mean that people are going to be able to borrow 50% of their annual earnings more than what they were able to do in the past. So that's definitely going to be a good thing in terms of uh, releasing the pressure on people. The only thing is, is you're now your interest rate is going to be higher because interest rates have gone up. And at the same time interest rates are going up, you're now being allowed to borrow more. So your interest rates are also going to be are going to be going up because of the rate and going up because you're actually borrowing more now as well. And at the same time that that is happening, you've got the Uh, cost of living crisis so you're going to have diesel in your car or petrol in your car you know putting groceries in your in your fridge um, heating your house has gone through the roof all of those are happening at the same time that you're looking at this mortgage increase so i'm not so sure i mean it's it's great from the point of view of people maybe they can get help from parents or something like that but there is going to be a, a difficulty for people to fund this um, but it does. It is good to see that they've increased the rates. The concrete levy. That was the next big thing. That was the government were deciding that this mica problem in the concrete, which is a like something like 160,000 homes across Ireland have got this problem with mica, and mica is a, uh, is like a sand type substance that's found inside of concrete, and it and it basically it doesn't have the same structure that some proper cement does and so it starts to break up after it's been built and so there's block work you can basically put your hand into the block work and pull lumps out of it so it's not strong it doesn't have the structural strength it's meant to. a lot of houses are really badly impacted by this and so a way to compensate was to add 10 percent to the bill and all construction projects were going to have this levy of 10 percent that was going to basically help the government fund fixing the mica problem now, the problem is, is, as I just mentioned, the construction industry is already facing massive, massive increases in, the, in, in its costs. And suddenly you're being told, oh, yeah, and we're going to add another 10 percent on top of that. So what the government has decided is that they're going to cut that to 5 percent and they're going to delay it until September of next year. So we're going to have to see what happens. That might that could be one of these political footballs or hot potatoes that basically they get kicked around and it might not happen at all. Glenvlay plots partnerships to free up development land this is interesting i mean this is really something that a lot of sort of resourceful property investors would be doing anyway but you're going out there you're looking for property to build houses and rather than having to buy the land and having to have this big land bank what you do is you go out and you partner with existing landowners and you just say look we will pay you a a small deposit and that will basically give us the right to the land at some point in the future and in the meantime, you've got you've received some money, but you're also going to get an increase in the value of the land when the planning permission is granted. So it means that a landowner is now becoming kind of a partner in the deal 
as opposed to, so let me give you a, a kind of a very simple example. I come along to you and I say, I like the piece of land that you own there. I would like to buy it from you today and I'll give you a hundred grand. And so the, the, the landowner gets a hundred grand. I am now the owner of that piece of land. What I would do is I would go off, get architects and the whole team and stuff, put a planning permission together and I would lodge it. And when the planning is granted, the value of that land is going to go up to the new level because it now has planning and it's ready to go. That planning permission increase on the land value might be to go from 100 to 200, let's say, just to throw out a figure, just to give you an example. So that now is 200. That 200 would be for me, the developer. And the original person who sold the land won't get any, of, wouldn't have gotten any of that. Now what we're into the situation is, instead of me giving 100 to the landowner, I'm going to maybe give five grand to the landowner, and then I'm going to go and get the planning permission. And then when the planning is granted and the property has gone from 100 to 200, the I might go back to the landowner and sort of say, here's another 115. So he is now getting a step up in the value. Instead of getting the 100, he's now getting, say, 115 more plus the five he originally got. So he's now getting, say, 20% more than he would have if he had sold off. And me, as the person who did all the work to get the planning and stuff, I've managed to get this property into my portfolio without having to pay the full amount, but it's now got zoning, it's ready to go. So it's a, it's a, it makes a lot of sense. And it is primarily because Lenve is a big uh, you know, house builder and they're currently working on 23 construction sites at the moment. So they're looking to deliver 4,500 houses and apartments um, this year or in the next year or two, whatever. Um, I actually just found this and I thought I lived in Spain for a couple of years and I just see that Spain, there's a headline today in the paper that Spain is shaking off the pandemic hangover as the economy surges. So it's interesting to read that given I spent a lot of time in Spain and uh, what we have is um, just the fact that Spain is growing faster than any of the other big uh, economies in the EU, like outperforming Germany, France, Italy, and the UK. So, and, and that's tourism based. And obviously they had two terrible years because their tourism industry was decimated by the pandemic, you weren't able to travel and all that, but everyone's now looking to go and make up for lost time. So they're getting a big influx. And this is good, um, I mean, I bought an owned property in Spain before, so it's interesting to see. Um, I see on board Planol have signed off on schemes for 438 houses. So again, more housing. I mean, we just can't get enough housing in this country um, because the uh, just we're just we've got such a housing crisis in this country at the moment. It's going to continue to be like this for years to come. I can't see them fixing it. Actually, I don't see it ever us ever getting to the point where we have more houses than we have, than we need. Um, there's also now, there's a plan for a ban on winter evictions that's gonna last until March. That's a new thing that came in just recently. And a lot of people are kind of kicking up in a big fuss about it. It is um, it is a difficult situation for, for anybody. O'Reilly, this is an interesting one. Joe O'Reilly, who was the guy that developed the Dundrum Town Center here, and he, you know, one of the bigger developers back during the boom years, and then he went through the whole kind of trouble that um, a lot of the big developers did go. He's in the talks at the moment to sell a 30-story tower that he has permission to go and build over near Guinness or over near Houston Station in Dublin. And so it's interesting that that's a major like property. The fact that it's 30 stories, it would make it the tallest building in Ireland. And what else have I got? Oh, yes, I found this. And um, last week, what I was talking about <clears throat> on my podcast, I was saying that if you're looking for any kind of signs that the market is getting a little bit shaky, shall we say, or anything, you just have to look at the fact that Oakmont, which is one of the more active developers, and that is um, Paddy McKillen Jr. and uh, a, a chap called Matt, I can't remember his second name, but those two guys have been incredibly active for the last number of years. And they've, they've done, they've bought, they've started, they bought hotels, bars, restaurants, they've got all of the trendy kind of pubs and restaurants, and they have the, um, they have the, the operational business as well called uh, Press Up Group. And so those guys are really, they're experts at this whole thing. And the Lucky Duck, which was this property that nobody could find a buyer for back 
you know, six, seven years ago. I can remember driving past it for years and it was derelict. And then these guys bought it, turned it into a trendy pub and suddenly it's valuable. And now it's on the market. And last week they were putting on, they put on the market, the Stella Cinema in Rathmines. So when one of the most active developers in the market is, or, and, and investors in the market is starting to put all of their properties up for sale, or certainly some of these landmark properties up for sale, you have to kind of wonder, is that a signal that the market has peaked and perhaps gone beyond the peak? I talk a lot about the what I call the market clock. And if you think about a clock face, the market is somewhere in the clock face. So midnight at the very top, that is the very, very top of the market. And then after you get to the top of the market, it's going to go to three o'clock. Three o'clock and on the way to three o'clock, it's a falling market. And it is going to continue falling, falling, falling all the way to six o'clock in the morning. When it gets to six o'clock in the morning, that is the lowest point in the market. You could go back and say that perhaps 2011, 2012 in the Irish market was 6 a.m. And probably 2019, I would say, was the top of the market. And in the last couple of years, we kind of see it, it has been a weird situation with the pandemic because of all the stimulus in the UK and things like that. You saw prices increasing in the UK. But in fact, the properties that I was selling back in 2019, we got the highest price then, and we would not get anything like that today if we were to go out there. So it does show you. Uh, it's just interesting to see this. I know this hotel because I spent many years going to the uh, to the, what was called the Central Hotel on Exchequer Street. And it's, they've, it's the first Hoxton Hotel, which is a UK hotel brand. And uh, they're, they've entered into the Irish market. And um, the final thing I've got on this before I open up to some questions is this is a thing that I saw Aldi advertising today. And what they were saying is that if you find a site for an Aldi to go and build, uh, to, to build a shopping center, they will pay you an amazing 1.5% finder's fee. And uh, so it says here, Aldi have ambitious acquisition and development program planned for the greater Dublin area. We're looking for great new sites and retail opportunities. In return, we're offering a 1.5% freehold or 10% leasehold finder's fee. Now, that might sound exciting to somebody who's, who's not kind of earning anything. But in reality, I don't find that all that exciting because what I, I used to do back in the day was you would find that and instead of bringing it to them, you would actually buy the land and you would by buy it, you would go off and you would find it, somebody to help finance it. Usually it was a bank. You go to the bank and say, I want to go and buy this piece of land. You'd buy the piece of land and then you would go to the likes of Aldi or whoever and you would say, um, I own this piece of land. I would like to put you guys in there and I would like you to become my tenant and I will collect the rent for you, from you for the next 20 years. And in that, like doing that, instead of 1.5% finder's fee, you were getting, you know, hundreds of thousands in the form of a investment that was now yours. And you had this tenant that like Ali would be a phenomenal tenant. The question is, would they be pre prepared to be a tenant? But it does say there that, uh, leasehold. So they are actually prepared to do that. So if you're the person who owns the land and uh, you can actually put them in there, you end up with a phenomenal investment. All right. Um, a quick mention of my uh, property accelerator. I do have a mastermind. Um, I'm only just quickly mentioning it because the intake has opened. And so I'm, uh, I'm there's, there's, there's a few people who've just recently joined. I'm mentioning it now, just in case any of you out there are unaware that the intake is open. It's a six months program, coaching with me. And, uh, and I go through you know, the whole thing on how to become an investor, how to uh, raise money from investors, how to uh, finance projects and all that kind of stuff. There's actually a presentation tomorrow at 4 p.m. And if you want to learn more about the program, you can jump on that call. You can find more details by going to my Calendly. Um, just look up Gavin J. Gallagher under Calendly and you'll find the, you can book the appointment in there. So I'm going to throw it open now to questions. So if anybody has a question, I'm going to stop sharing the slides and I'm going to have a look in the various chats around the place and see. So I see in my uh, YouTube here, we have uh, Adama is saying good morning. Hello, Adama. It's good to see you. Um, hi, Gavin. I'm about to purchase my second rental property. My goal was to have five 
um, by two to three years? Should I hold off? I would say, yes, uh, if it was my decision, I would be holding off. And I'd say, like, it's a good thing to have goals, like saying that you would like to have two or three, you know, five properties within a time period. It's great to have goals. And I definitely agree. I'm very goal driven. And so I will say I want to have X number of things done within a time period. The problem is, is you can't be dogmatic and kind of like a slave to the plan because you've got to get the data has to come in and it's, it's new data and your data is coming in and saying, hold on, prices are falling. The market is falling. So with that new data, does it suggest that perhaps you should change your, uh, your plans and your attitude? And I would say, yes, there is a chance that interest rates are going to continue to rise. And because of that, it's going to put pressure on the ability of people to um, fund properties. And so there's a chance that properties will fall off in value. Now, it, you know, the Irish market is particularly dif difficult because of the acute shortage of property. So it is possible that it will weather the storm better. But if you're looking at the UK or the US or any market like that, they are already falling dramatically. And so you're kind of into a situation where really, is, is the Irish market going to be you know, completely oblivious to this? I don't think so. And the reason I say that is because it boils down to affordability. Can people afford the same amount of rent or the same mortgage as they could one year ago? Let's just look at a year ago, you're, you're, you paid your mortgage, you paid your rent, and you had a certain amount of money left over. If you're in that situation and you have a certain amount of money left over, is that same money being, um, is it there or is it being eroded away? Now I see that you're buying outright. It's great that you're buying outright. That definitely removes the pressure, but that doesn't say that, like you're gonna find that tenants that were prepared to pay a certain amount before, they're not as, uh, there's, there's, there's not the same affordability out there. Um, if you're buying outright, it means you have cash. Cash is going to be king, I think, in the next. Now, it might take a year, but you're talking, if you were looking at the beginning of this talk, this, Goldman Sachs are expecting a 20% fall in UK commercial property prices by 2024. Now, this is not something that you can rush. When this happened back in, I can remember 2007, 2008, all of this kind of bad news, headlines, all of the kind of the fear, everything that we're seeing, that's what started back in 2007, 2008. And I can remember being very clued into this and sort of saying, seems to be an awful lot of bad news. A lot of people ignored it. And fast forward a year or two, suddenly you realize, whoa, we're in a major problem here, but it doesn't happen overnight. And so we've got, when, I can remember it being, I, I remember thinking to myself, there seems to be an awful lot of negative news in the US and an awful lot of negative news in the papers and stuff. But, you know, people are still going about their business. And so I should probably just ignore it. Then I started finding that deals that I was, I was, I, I had a deal to sell a property at a really strong price. That deal fell through. I had another deal to sell another property at a really strong price. That fell through. And that was when it started to dawn on me that, uh oh, there's definitely something in the air here. These prices that I was getting before, which were really strong prices that I was happy to get, suddenly deals were falling out of bed to, to do that, to achieve it. And that's when you start to read this. So what happens then? I say, okay, I'll have to go and find another buyer. So you go out and you sort of put the property on the market again. You have to put it in the papers and all that kind of stuff. No buyers. So what do you have to do to get the property away? You have to reduce the price. So I can remember reducing the price. And even though I dropped the price by 10%, no takers, drop it by another 10%. And this is not like straight away. This is over the period of maybe six months as you realize you have a problem developing. Six months later, okay, drop it another 10%. And then six months later, geez, like still nobody, drop it another. I can remember I had a property valued at 5.5 million um, back in 2007. And I ended up selling that property at the very in 2012 and I sold it for 1.5 million. So it fell in value by almost 75%. And so, and at the time that was happening to me, it was worth five and a half. I was looking for five and a half. I didn't get it. I dropped the price to four and a half. I didn't get it. People were offering 3.9. I was turning my nose up at it. Then I suddenly kind of thought, geez, it's, it's not selling. 
maybe I'll drop the price. I'll, I'll go back to those people that offer 3.9. Suddenly they had changed and they were saying, no, no, it's now 3.5. And then I was turning my nose up at that. This is where emotions gets in the way of decision making. Instead of being cold and unemotional and saying, what's the market value? Okay, sell it at that. Um, the reality is, is that you kind of, you stick your nose up at a low, what you perceive to be a low ball offer. But I ended up chasing that property down, down, down. And when I sold it at 1.5, I initially got 1.9 and the guy agreed to buy it at 1.9. And then it took a while to get the legals and stuff done. And he came back and said, I'm not going to pay you 1.9. I'll pay you 1.5. Uh, and so he knocked another 300 grand off. And at that stage, I, I felt like, you know, sticking the two fingers up at his face. But I knew that if I do that, I'm not going to sell this property at all. And so I was back into the situation where, you know, what, I'm going to have to swallow this and I'm going to have to basically offload the property at that price. So um, it's painful. Yeah. And, and you just got to be practical and kind of move on. I'm going to ask the, uh, I'm going to answer some questions. Yeah, there's a lot of comments in the, geez, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. We've got TikTok questions. Um, uh, let me just see. What do I think about central bank relaxing the mortgage rates? Well, I've covered that. I think it's a good thing, but I think that people are going to still struggle because of the new um, pressures on them. And you've got all of this pressure on people because of the fact that you have got, um, the cost of living crisis and interest rate increases. So the incremental increase in the amount you can borrow is a good thing, but can you afford that increased level of monthly payments? That's going to be the real question. Um, there's going to be, everyone is going to be broke. Yeah, exactly. 100% mortgages coming back. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, the Celtic tiger. Um, I don't think 100% mortgages will ever come back. They certainly won't come back in the Irish market. Like they've already over in the US, like, you know, people just have such short memories straight away. They're back doing all of those kind of crazy um, rules and stuff like that. But here in Ireland, like the Irish government stepped in and had to take over AIB Bank, Bank of Ireland, uh, Anglo-Irish Bank, permanent TSB, like every single lender on the high street was taken over by the Irish government. And so that being the case, there is absolutely no chance that it's going to be allowed to kind of go back to the way it once was. Um, should I hold off purchasing my second property? I'm about to sign contracts. Well, look, it depends if you're if you're buying, if it's a rental property and you've got it at a really, really good price or if you're getting a very, very strong yield. You see, it's, it's often difficult to kind of answer these questions. And that goes for a. Uh, Irish uh, Akita, who, who asked the question, you know, if you're buying a property and you've got a phenomenal price or if you're getting at a really good yield. So, for example, like there's property, you can buy a price, you can buy property in parts of the city center. And, uh, you know, it's very, very low, low yield and you'll sort of put the property um, up for rent. And the most you can hope probably on the amount that you paid for it is maybe three or four percent yield. But if you're buying in uh, different areas or in rural kind of parts of the country and stuff, you can be looking at 15 to 20 percent. And, and I know um, there's a lot of people out there who are achieving those kind of yields on things like HMOs and stuff. And so if you're able to achieve that, well, then the mathematics changes a little bit because you're well able to afford the, the, the payments and you've got a very, very nice cash flow. But if you're buying a property for a home, and you're going to be like really, really stretched as it is, then you, you might just want to think it through because you could find that the prices are going to increase in the next year or two. Uh, your, your mortgage cover and all that kind of stuff is going to go up. And so if you're already struggling to pay today, I think it's only going to get more difficult. So just be careful about that. Um, but if you've got a good interest, um, if you've got a good rental, re rental income from the property, well, then maybe you know, you're not going to be buying it for... Uh, for the capital increase in value, you're buying it for the cash flow. So it's a totally different motivation as to why. But if you're looking to go and like, if you have a load of cash sitting there, um, there is going to be, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but in my opinion, there's going to be distressed opportunities coming up for sale because there are people out there who would have borrowed too much. And they, they had this kind of really optimistic view of the market growing and growing and growing. And suddenly it's contracting. And because it's contracting, you're going to have a situation where 
they have over over leveraged themselves. They're going to have to get out of that deal. And so they're going to have to put the property up for sale. They might try to sell it for a profit. Uh, I, it's unlikely they'll get it for a profit. And so they're going to have to now take a loss. And that happens. I, I've, I've had to sell properties at a loss. It's very painful. Most people don't do it straight away. So this won't happen overnight. It could be a year from now before you start seeing people kind of getting distressed. In fact, it could be 18 months before banks start sort of putting them under pressure to kind of sell and stuff. Should you pay it out of your own pocket? The levy shouldn't be put on the consumer. Um, I don't know exactly what that. Landlords are dumping for a reason. You're going to wait. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, landlords who own one rental. Yeah, I mean, I see it depends on your portfolio and stuff like that. But if you're over, if you're leveraged highly, I would be careful because I do think rates are going to increase. You see, it's all driven by inflation. We have a situation now today. I think the figures for UK inflation came out at 10.1 percent. OK, that is the highest inflation since the 1980s. OK, you're looking at a 40 years since inflation was at this level. 40 years ago, the average mortgage you know, person was paying maybe 16% a year, uh, 16% interest rate. And we're all complaining about, you know, four and 5%. So imagine if it was to jump to 15 or 16%. Now, uh, who knows what it's going to go to? And perhaps, you know, but you've got the Ukraine war, you've got the supply chain issues, you've got China with their zero COVID rules, closing down factories and all this. So everything is delayed. Everything is taking, is, is, is being pushed up. You've also got this whole thing because of the pandemic and what people learned about their supply chains. Like take the Irish government, okay? We could not get masks and we could not get gowns for hospital workers to protect them in the hospitals. So what happened? We had to go and do a special deal with China and we had to fly, I think it was nine Aer Lingus planes had to fly to China to collect something like 300 million euros worth of magical equipment and fly it back to Ireland. That's how desperate it was. That And so suddenly a lot of governments that were in that situation where you actually had one government bidding against another government and outbidding, and you had America basically saying that consignment that you're sending to France, forget about it. You're sending it to us. We'll give you an extra 10% or whatever. That was happening left, right and center. Everyone was getting very upset. The people who were selling it were delighted because they had people bidding on huge sums of money. And what ended up happening was those governments decided, you know what, we're not going to be in this situation again. We are not going to have our supply chain restricted to the China or somewhere that it, where it has to go in a ship. We want, to, we want to go and bring it onshore. And so you're going to have a lot of people starting to look at manufacturing either in their country or within, the, say, the continent. So we'll be looking at Instead of stuff coming from China, we'll be looking at where can we get this from? Can we get it from Poland? Can we get it from somewhere in the EU that is cheaper? Uh, we might have to pay a lot more, but it'll be cheaper than buying it in Ireland. But we will pay more rather than have, be relying on the Chinese market or something like that. There's so many messages in TikTok. It's kind of a, so let's see if I can get through this. Um, I'm going to keep going. Let's see, refinance a house to buy another property. Is it worth it? It depends, like refinancing a house to buy another. If, and this goes down to the financial analysis, like if, you're, if you've if you got a very, very strong rental return coming from your property, then maybe you can easily afford it. But if you're marginal, then I wouldn't take, like you need to leave enough room there for rates to increase. So let's say you're getting in uh, 50,000 a year in income from your property and your mortgage rate is 25,000, okay, You've got plenty of room there to go and you know increase your loan and stuff. But don't forget that interest rates are going to increase over the next couple of years. So your 25 grand that you pay out in interest might go to 30, 35, 40. So don't go and over leverage yourself and get to the point where now you're actually negative. You're going to have the extra income from the other properties, rental income to add into that, obviously. But just make sure that you're buying into, you're adding into your figures the possible increase. I've only got like another couple of minutes, guys. So hopefully I'll be able to get through some of these questions. Um, how far down will prices go? That's like crystal ball gazing stuff. It's very hard to say. Like in the US, investors will lend you money to invest in a property. It, well, they would have, but you see, you're going to be, you're going to want to be pretty convincing 
to investors. Like the way uh, in my um, in my mastermind program, I teach people how to go to investors and pitch investors and present deals to investors. You've got to be very, very compelling. You've got to come across as an outright expert for somebody to believe that you are a safe bet. If you go and you've never really done this before, it's going to be pretty unconvincing to uh, to a, an investor that they should give their money over because investors are going to be looking in the paper. They're going to be saying, we're in for a rough ride. The market's going to start kind of getting difficult. And do I really want to give this money to this sort of beginner or this novice investor? Now, if you're somebody with years and years of experience and you're saying, I want to borrow money from you because I see an opportunity to go and buy a lot of distressed property. We're going to pick up bargains left, right and center. That's maybe much more convincing. But do you have a track record for delivering on that kind of stuff? You need to you need to be convincing. Um, let me see. A crash, people won't be able to afford to pay mortgages. Price will go down. Yeah, that's that's effectively what I see happening um, as rates continue to increase. Let's keep going. One thousand, uh, thousands being laid off in the U.S. Yeah, I mean the U.S. is, but the U.S. is different. Like the U.S. is a brutal market. Like they just. They don't have the same rules around uh, firing and uh, hiring and all that kind of stuff. So, in um, you know, you can't just lay somebody off like that here in this country the way you can in the U.S. Um, let's have a look. Um, somebody being banned on Irish Ryanair flight. I don't know what that's about. Um, let me see. I'm going to flick down to the to, towards the bottom and just start answering the most recent questions. What are my thoughts on CBI changing mortgage lending requirements? Yeah, that, I mean, I've covered it already today. Um, I've talked about it a couple of times on this particular call. So I'm not going to go into that one right now. But if you watch back on the replay, those of you looking at TikTok, this is all live streamed over on my YouTube channel. So if my YouTube channel is called Gavin J. Gallagher on real estate, you'll find it in the YouTube, uh, in the TikTok profile. Um, am, are my cynical about the central bank's motives for the increase? You have to be a little bit cynical because like they've been holding the four for all of these years when prices were low. And now all of a sudden that prices are kind of like topped out and people are under pressure. And now they're increasing the rules. Like why didn't they increase those rules way back when we could all get property at half the price that they are today? So um, housing crisis, new bills needed regardless of the economic situation. That's true. But I think we're going to find that there's an awful lot of projects that are going to get shelved now. And um, I think uh, I mentioned it earlier that the big developers that buy, that, that build up big apartment blocks, apartment blocks are no longer economically viable. And it's very, very difficult. Um, I, sorry, I can't go and join anyone else into the call right now because I'm about to finish. But the big developers, they, that they develop apartments. Apartment buildings are different to houses, okay? When you're building a housing scheme, let's say, like we're in the process of building 50 units in Shank Hill at the moment. Those 50 units, we're doing it in phases. So you build the front phase first. You, when you, those are finished, we sell them. We get the money in for those and we put the money into paying for the second phase being built. And when that is built, we sell those, we get the money in and it allows us to complete the, the rest of it. So you're recycling the money. The sales that you're getting from the first phase goes into completing the second phase, goes into completing the third. You're never borrowing maximum amount of the project cost. So let's say building 50 houses costs 5 million, okay? Or let's say whatever it costs, 5 million. If you're doing it in a phased basis, instead of borrowing 5 million, you might actually never have to go above, say, two and a half because you're phasing it and you're getting money in from the sales and that goes towards the next. Um, and so you're paying down some of the, the debt that you might have borrowed. With an apartment building, totally different kettle of fish because you're looking at, say, 100 apartments. That's a big, big apartment block. That might cost you 30 million to build. And if you're talking about 30 million, all of that has to be borrowed. You can't phase the front of the apartment building because the rear of the apartment building is the same building. And so it all has to be built at the same time. So you're going to end up in a situation where you're, you've borrowed the full 30 million and then and only then can you start selling it. Now, back in the day, back in 2007, when we were selling loads of apartments, you would sell the apartments to individuals. Somebody would come along, they'd get a mortgage, you'd sell them one apartment and you would have 99 more to sell. 
And that was the way the market worked. But since then, the construction standards have increased. Uh, all this climate stuff has been added, all these rules and regulations. You've got building standards, you've got planning standards, you've got densities. All of this stuff has all changed. It's pushed up the cost of building uh, apartments, building houses. And the actual cost of building an apartment building is more than the market would tolerate in terms of selling them individually to owners. So if I built 100 apartments and said, right, here's 100 apartments, hands up who wants to buy them, okay? The people that are prepared to buy them and the mortgages that they can get would not cover the cost of building that apartment building. Whereas a big fund, say from Germany or something like that, they'll come along and they can afford because they're looking at this as a big investment in, and they're just looking at the income return from the rental. They're not looking at what's it worth in the market, what's this worth, what's that. They're just saying, right, I put 100 million into this building and I'm getting a three three and a half percent yield. That makes a lot of sense. If I put 100 million into German government bonds, I would get 1% or half a percent. Therefore, makes a lot of sense to go and buy these properties instead. The problem is now that bond yields are creeping up in because of interest rates and inflation and all that. So suddenly those same big German funds are looking at this going, why would I spend all that money when, uh, on, you know, for a three and a half percent when German bonds are now getting closer and closer to the same. So you're comparing similar uh, sort of yields, but you're not comparing similar sort of characteristics as an asset. Like an apartment building has to be managed, has to be held. It's obviously, you know, there's a huge amount managing all of that property. Whereas a bond, you just push a button and that's it, it's sold. It doesn't cost you anything to hold it. All of the, you know, the characteristics are very, very different. So bear that in mind. Guys, we're, we're reaching the end here. I'm going to ask if anyone, we've got a question here from Christina. How do you balance up time in the market versus timing the market and then selling when like, uh, when like now is really makes sense? Do you sell, say, 10% of your portfolio, keep 90% or sell 100%, put it all in your war chest? What I would say is, first of all, yes, time in the market versus timing the market. You need to look at your the overall strategy. Um, are, you, are you a short-term trader or are you long-term? Are you thinking 10 years, 15 years? Uh, like, what is your time frame for this investment? If you're somebody who just wants to make enough money to flip a property or something like that, well, then definitely you don't want to be in the property market right now. But if you're somebody who is sort of saying, I'm trying to build a portfolio and it's, 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 I'm doing it because I want to have a rental income that will help me with retirement. Uh, when I decide to retire, I'll have 30 properties paying me a nice annual return. And so I won't have to run around chasing my tail and stuff like that. That's actually a very good strategy. That's not a reason to go and sell now. Um, I would think that stay the course, but reflect on where you are in terms of interest rates, reflect on how much have you borrowed, and then do some testing of your portfolio. Like have a look at your rents and have a look at your interest cover and sort of say, right, what if interest rates were to increase by X? Have you spoken to your bank about fixing rates on your loans? You might find that if you decided to go to the bank and say, I'd like to fix all my loans for five years, you might find that it's so costly that you don't want to actually even consider that. Um, if that's the case, then you might kind of say to yourself, whoa, you know, it, whatever they're saying that they'd like to fix them at, that's where rates are likely to go because that's how they base it on. They base it on where it looks like rates will end up. And so, um, what you might find is that it makes sense to sell off some of your marginal properties, maybe the properties that are bringing in a low yield, if you have any in your portfolio. If you've got a portfolio that has some really good profit you know, generating uh, income. So if you have something that's producing 10, 15% yield, maybe just hang on to that. Or maybe you're getting a better yield from that property than it would be valued by the market. And I know that people that have HMOs and things like that, often you get a fantastic return on cash, but you don't actually get that re registered by the market. So if you go and ask a valuer, he'll just value your property the same as the one next door, even though you might be getting twice the rent as the one next door. So that's not a re I wouldn't sell in that case because 
the rental return is far better in your hand than it is sold to somebody else and not getting the value for that. So I don't know, was that helpful? Uh, <laughs> all right, Christina, thank you for your question. And uh, guys, I hope you found this useful. Every Wednesday at one o'clock, Lunch and Learn, I put this one out. And uh, so hope to see you guys next week. Since I was answering Christina's question, 13 more comments on TikTok. I'm going to have to figure out a way of doing this more efficiently. Um, guys, I'm going to finish up now. I see the last question. 30K will only get you a mortgage. All right, I'll let you guys. All right, guys, I got to go. <laughs> I got to get back to work. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade. I hope you found this episode useful. If you did, please take a moment to leave a review over on iTunes or indeed if you're watching on the YouTube channel, please subscribe, hit give us a like below and maybe even leave a comment. Uh, if you do have questions and if you have a topic that you think would be useful for me to cover in future episodes, please leave that comment down below in the uh, YouTube channel or indeed reach out and join me on the Facebook group. We have a dedicated uh, listener Facebook group. It's called Behind the Facade Community and you can message me in there and, and I do some private kind of live streams in there as well. Uh, alternatively, reach out to me via social media and uh, indeed stay in communication with all the various things I'm working on and get my weekly newsletter delivered right to your email by joining me over on my tribe and that is done by signing up to the newsletter in the gavinjgallagher.com website. All right, that's all for now, guys. I'll see you all next week.